Awesome. Okay, good evening. Um, well, good there's still afternoon. Good afternoon. And welcome to Sister Reach's monthly uh social justice creature series. I am um Elder Victor Hannah, Faith and Education Outreach Coordinator at Sister Reach. Sister Reach is a grassroots 501c3 reproductive um organization, reproductive justice organization founded by, of course. Um, Cherie Scott in 2011 um, in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, Sister Reach supports the reproductive autonomy of women and teens of color, poor and rural women, LGBTQIA plus people and their families um, through the framework of reproductive justice. Um, Sister Reach's mission is to empower our base to lead healthy lives, raise healthy families, and live a healthy, sustainable, uh, in uh, healthy, sustainable communities. This is achieved through um, a working or working by a four prong um, strategy, which includes education, uh, policy, and advocacy, cultural shift, and uh, harm re uh, reduction locally, nationally, and internationally. So today our guest is Latricia Adams. So welcome, uh, Latricia. So glad to have you on the Sister Reach platform. Um, she is a proud uh, native of Memphis, Tennessee, and is the founder, CEO, and president of Black Millennials for Flint, BM4F, a national um, environmental justice and civil rights organization with the purpose of bringing like-minded organizations together to collectively take action and advocate against crisis of lead exposure, specifically in African-American and Latinx uh, communities throughout the nation. Uh, Latricia is a proud HBCU graduate <laughs> uh, a K through 12 educator and the youngest African American woman appointed to the White House Environmental Justice Ad uh, uh, Advisory uh, Council, W H E J A C. So help me please welcome our social justice preacher series guest for the October 2023, Latricia Adams. Well, thank you so much um, for that wonderful introduction. Um, if I need a hype man, I know who I need to call. <laughs> um, so, uh, so excited to, to be in this space, um, just to share a little bit um, around the intersection between um, faith and environmental justice. Um, so I wanna just give a disclaimer that this is just a tidbit. There are whole curricula <laughs> that are dedicated um, to this topic. Um, but really excited to have this space and platform to, to just share, even if it's from an entry point um, perspective. So I always like to begin, especially in this sacred space, with honoring um, both the, the elders and ancestors of, of this movement. Um, so, of course, being in the space um, around reproductive justice, we want to uplift the 12 founding mothers of the RJ movement. Oftentimes, far too often, when we talk about reproductive justice, is through the lens of whiteness. So I would be remiss not to start out correctly with honoring um, those Black women, Black people that actually started this work. Um, adjacent to that, I do the same as it relates to environmental justice. So acknowledging um, uh, uh, the, the grandfather uh, of the movement, the environmental justice movement, Dr. Robert Bullard, um, which is down in the state of Texas. So definitely has his work cut out for him, but has been so instrumental um, into even with, with me um, starting this environmental justice work. 
And then also honoring and uplifting who is now an ancestor, the one and only Hazel Johnson, who is deemed lovingly as the mother of the environmental justice movement, hailing from the great city of Chicago, um, starting the work as it relates to environmental justice through the lens of housing. So I wanted to start this space out right with uplifting those who made it possible for me to be in this space this, this afternoon. All right, so let's get into it. So I really love um, how intersectionality, that a sister reaches thing, okay? Like really connecting those dots. For the purposes of this conversation is around the connection between reproductive justice, environmental justice, and faith. And so a theme for tonight or for this afternoon will be, where is Black women's access to free will? So when we think about this work from a spiritual and even dare I say biblical sense, we forget that when we talk about birth, that still is very much so connected to our free will. And one of the things that happens with black women is far too often, we don't even have access to free will where there are people who don't have black rooms that are making decisions about how we govern ourselves, about whether or not we want to or don't want to bring life into this world. So we'll see that thing throughout our conversation this evening. And I always like to leave with a quote that's not my quote, um, but from a young lady named Kelly Davis, who is a phenomenal um, birth justice worker. Um, the womb is everybody's first environment, literally everyone. Everyone that's on this side of the earth and under the earth, the first environment is the womb. And so when we think about that, just as much as we are trying to protect um, our physical environment, it's also important to understand that the environment in which we grow, where we are housed, where we become people, needs to equally be protected as well. So getting right into it, I promise I'm going to keep this lively, but let's keep it real and talk about the history of what I call environmental terrorism on Black births. Um, so, of course, when we think about um, the transatlantic slave trade and the horrific experiences with childbirthing people, I want to forge a little bit fast forward and talk about the Industrial Revolution. Um, because there are significant intersections as it relates to environmental injustice, environmental racism, and specifically around Black births. So during the Industrial Revolution, where white folks was making a whole lot of money off of Black folks, per usual, right? So the Black body, including Black wombs, have always been commodified. So specifically with the Industrial Revolution, there was an introduction to something called agrochem or agrochemical innovation. So essentially this technology, quote unquote, revolutionized the approach to agriculture. Now keep in mind, when we think about black folks, folks from African descent and our connection to the land, this concept, this introduction to this innovative technology was very much so through the lens of Western society and not based on what we were accustomed to and acclimated to as being descendants from Africa around natural approaches with our relationship to the earth. So unfortunately, with a lot of these rising and chemicals, pesticides, for example, they include things that we can barely even pronounce. So things such as sulfuric acid, iron sulfate, copper sulfate, nitrate, all of these different chemicals that do have lasting impacts on um, reproductive health. That's both for uh, childbirthing people and for, for men as well. One of the things that's a really key thing to note about this exposure to these chemicals as it alters your reproductive organs, it also is connected to epigenetics, meaning that this then in turn becomes genetic. So it can literally transcend over time from generation to generation. So let that sit with us for a minute. So that means, for example, if our great, 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 great grandmother gave birth to a baby girl, guess what? Those eggs that were inside of that baby girl could potentially be impacted from the very same chemicals and stress and a myriad of things that were disruptive in the daily lives of childbirthing people, particularly during this, this moment in time. 
So going to this other point, so in this instance, in the Industrial Revolution, it still was pre-emancipation. So you literally had Black women, Black childbirth and people working in fields, working directly with these pesticides that were literally killing them and also threatening the lives of, of uh, children um, and impacting just births long term, right? So some of these chemicals not only cause miscarriages, but also cause long-term and lifelong reproductive health issues, not just for them, but again, connected it back to epigenetics, which literally carried on over time and literally can be leaked to some of the um, instances of infertility, other reproductive health issues that we even see in present day. Um, in addition to this, some things that we are very familiar with as childbirthing people in the Black community is how these pesticides can be connected to uterine fibroids. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but I am, I have fibroids. Um, I learned last year that I have fibroids. Many women in my family have fibroids. Going back to how this has been a generational issue around the environmental terrorism and attack on Black births, on Black bodies, on Black wombs. There are also connections as it relates to endometriosis as well. And then again, a lot of these pollutants that literally came 200 plus years ago are still readily available and invasive in our environment, which is what's called legacy pollution. So it's still impacting our soil, which gets in our water and then still um, permeates throughout the air, which unfortunately disproportionately impacts people that look like me, um, our Latinx brothers and sisters, as well as indigenous communities as well. So I'm gonna keep leading back to this point. All of these different things that were going on that were impacting black wombs, where was black women's access to free will? We didn't ask for any of this, but it's still very much so impacting our bodies, our wombs, our babies. So let's go a little bit further into history with uh, the Great Depression, specifically around the tail end of the Great Depression. Um, I'm not sure where all viewers may be from, but I'm going to speak with this particular lens through my hometown of, of Memphis. So specifically, there was a boom um, towards the latter part of the Great Depression. Um, as we, we speak about and think about World War II, anytime we talk about war, you think about pollution. If you hadn't made that connection, I'm going to tell you why. So a lot of the weaponry um, that was used and developed during both World War I and World War II were highly toxic. And a lot of that assembly, a lot of the work around weaponry, those facilities, those industries were actually located in majority Black and Latinx communities. For the purposes of this example, I want to use Memphis as an example. In addition to the war that was going on or the tail end of the war uh, after or post the Great Depression, there also was the rise in what we know from, we are now super familiar with, which is petrochemical plants or what we like to also call the fossil fuel industry. So specifically bringing it back to where my parents met, where my great grandparents um, landed after they moved from um, the state of Texas. Um, in the heart of South Memphis, in the Riverside community, what's now known as the Valero Refinery used to be called the Delta Refinery, which um, still has the same types of legacy pollution that we saw in the 40s that has been compounded and still negatively impacted majority Black families today. So where this refinery is located is very important. It's literally in the middle of a Black residential community across the street from the Valero Refinery, literally are homes. Also adjacent to the Valero Refinery is other uh, chemical bearing and pollutant, polluters um, in that community where it becomes a trifecta of pollution because right down the middle of the homes that are in Riverside, and the Valero refinery is a highway, is Interstate 55. So when we think about all of these elements of pollution, it's directly impacting this Black community. To add a bit more context to that, research shows that if you live in proximity up to five miles, now keep in mind the Valero refinery is literally less than a mile away from houses. 
So specifically, if you live within proximity up to five miles from a petrochemical plant or refinery, it increases the risk of development of fibroids among a myriad of other things such as thyroid issues and other endocrine-based um, challenges as well, just by living in proximity to a Valero refinery. So that's day in and day out being exposed to these chemicals, whether it be impacted in the air, in the soil, um, in the water. Also important thing to note why when we talk about environmental terrorism, we also have to talk about environmental racism. So one of the conundrums that is bred from institutions such as white supremacy, it puts people in a, a very precarious situation. So specifically during this particular time in the 1940s, it still was very much so the Jim Crow South. South Memphis or the Riverside community being one of the places where Black people were allowed to live, it was intentional that these polluting factories and industries were strategically placed in Black communities. It is, I would be remiss not to mention redlining, for example, also being a culprit into why certain industries went into Black communities in particular. Um, also thinking about this, it's not just where we live, right? My church home where I was baptized, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, is in the heart of South Memphis as well. So this not only impacts people from a residential perspective, it also exposes places where our children play or played, you know, for generations, as well as faith-based institutions as well, being directly impacted by these toxins in majority Black communities. So making this a little bit more personal, so I mentioned earlier, you know, unfortunately, I found out in 2022 um, that I had fibroids. Later on in the year 2022, in December 17th, to be exact, my father, who um, is was born in, in Mississippi, which has its own slate of environmental issues, um, you know, was raised and grew up in the same community where you see smokestacks as you go into South Memphis that comes from industries like Valero, right? But in addition to that, open excuse me for it, this dog in the background. Um, but in addition to that, when we talk about these environmental toxins, it also impacts thyroid issues where both myself and my mother have lifelong issues with thyroid um, challenges, specifically with my mom has Hashimoto's disease. Um, it causes um very disruptive um, instances with um, your reproductive health, with your menstrual cycle, the list goes on and on. It also causes significant weight gain and weight loss. We know in the black community, when we experience weight gain, the first thing we blame it on is behavioral issues, but there are connections back to things that exist in the environment as well. All of these things can be linked back to just by being in proximity to a petrochemical plant or a refinery. So this is a little bit wordy, but I'm going to summarize it really uh, quickly, um, but also some things to take into consideration as we go down this timeline, if you will, uh, with um, the Flint water crisis. I would absolutely be remiss not to uplift how this particular crisis is so interconnected as it relates to environmental um, injustice, environmental racism, environmental terrorism, all of those things, and the impact on Black births. So specifically with the Flint water crisis, some key facts to note. So the infant death rate for Flint more than doubled that of the United States. Literally in one year, um, in April 2024, will mark one decade since the horrific switch from the Detroit water system to the Flint River occurred, which caused the Flint water crisis. Also looking at low birth weight, the percentage of low birth weight infants in Flint was 14.6%, which was 32% higher than the country average and 40% higher than the state average. When we look at the social um, demographics of Flint, Michigan, it is a majority Black city. And with high poverty, again, this was intentional where this is not anything new. As we look at this over time, we see the recurring theme, the recurring thread that these instances happen more often than not in majority black communities, as well as black and Latinx, um, excuse me, Latinx and indigenous communities as well. Making this even more poignant, um, 
Some research that came from the Yale School of Public Health found that Black mothers specifically that were impacted by the Flint water crisis found that children born to those Black mothers were expo exposed to contaminated water in Flint. Um, they had significantly lower birth rates on average compared to those in other cities. Again, there's a direct correlation between exposure to lead poisoning or, or lead exposure as well as lead poisoning. Some other aspects from lead poison that impact um, black births, the black wounds is preterm birth, low birth weight, stillbirth, cognitive issues, that's both for the mother and the, the child. And then unfortunately it can lead to death as well. Going back to this theme, with all of these things that are happening over time, that are happening in Black communities, that are impacting the environment, that are in turn impacting Black births, where was Black women's access to free will? We didn't ask for this. This was not a choice. It was forced on us, right? So when we think about this from a space of spirituality, the impact that this not only has on physical wounds, but the mental toll generations, right? This is not new. This has literally been going on for centuries and how that impacts the entire birthing process, how that impacts even people's desires to give birth, knowing that there are so many various, so many variables that exist in the environment that's bred from fascism, that's bred from racism, that literally impacts Black people from procreating, right? It's all interconnected. So I wanna bring this back to Memphis, still on the topic of lead poisoning, for example. So I mentioned earlier that um, I was baptized um, at Pilgrim Rest Baptist Church. This is the same place where my parents were married, where almost all of my first cousins were baptized, um, pretty much a staple in, in um, our family. This map is actually from Memphis Black Gas and Water. It's a GIS map where essentially you can type in any address in Memphis to determine whether or not there are lead service lines that are connected to that property. Now, looking at these different colored dots, green means that you're, you're good to go. There's no presence of lead. Yellow means that it's unknown. It could or it could not be led there, but it hasn't been confirmed. What we communicate to people, if you have something yellow indicated by your property that you want to side with, it may be highly likely that there may be lead present. Now, what's more devastating, these gray dots, that absolutely means that lead is present. When we pull up this map, we see right here at this church is connected to a lead service line. So it's not just the issue that's pervasive in our households. It's literally where our children go to school, where we pray. Everything is, is at risk when we talk about environmental racism, right? This is a Black church and a Black community. And we see in the surrounding area, look at all of those gray dots that represents the presence of lead throughout the community, right? In the heart of South Memphis, a majority still to this day Black community and has been since post-emancipation, right? So bringing this a little bit closer to some other issues that are pervasive as it relates to environmental racism around the climate crisis. Um, specifically, you know, at first it was an issue that was pretty much so disproportionately impacted Black people and Latinx people and Indigenous people, and it still is, but it didn't start to be more popular until white people started to be inconvenienced. But when we bring this a little bit closer to see who it is that are being directly impacted, let's take a look again at Black women. So based on a 2020 study, and this was really monumental around when this study was released because it was at the height of COVID-19, but a 2020 study suggests or found that pregnant Black women are at higher risk for out, adverse birth outcomes due to environmental effects of climate change. Now that ranges between flooding, for example, it ranges with extreme cold and extreme heat, um, so I want to uplift a real life example of, of something that happened in Memphis in 2021. So in 2021, and also again in 2022, we saw significant um, increases in extreme cold. So because a city like Memphis, it's not supposed to get below zero and getting super cold. We don't have the infrastructure to sustain such cold weather. 
Nevertheless, we are not, you know, <laughs> we, we are still going through this climate crisis like many people are globally, right? So specifically in 2021, what we're finding in places like Memphis with issues with extreme cold, for example, not only does the power go out, the water goes out as well. So literally in the winter of 2021, when there were extreme issues with extreme cold, we literally had mothers that reached out to us that were like two or three days postpartum, leaving the hospital, having to go into their homes. The power is out, there's no water, they have other children, Think about the, the physical and mental toll that that has on somebody postpartum. When we talk about the climate crisis, oftentimes those nuances around what climate change and what extreme weather means for Black women, for Black childbirth and people are absent from that conversation. That's why it's so important for us to have platforms and for organizations like Sister Reach to exist where we are uplifting those issues that are very specific to historically disenfranchised communities from people who don't necessarily have those platforms to lift some of these very specific issues that are resulted or the outcomes from climate change. In addition to that, um, as it relates to the climate crisis, on top of legacy pollution that hits Black communities the hardest, you have issues with asthma and other respiratory issues. When you think about childbirthing people, that makes it even more difficult and makes the birth even more risky with these other compounding environmental issues that, again, are the most pervasive in majority Black communities. So I want to stop there. Again, um, I know that was quite a bit to take in uh, as far as that's just a snippet of the intersection of uh, environmental justice, reproductive justice. And again, that faith, that theme is all of these different things are happening that are completely removed from Black women's voices, right? That are impacting Black wombs. But Black women are not even invited to the space, to the table, to even have an opportunity to talk about these things from their perspective. But I want to pause here and welcome further discourse and questions. Wow, Latricia, you gave us a whole lot. And so, um, first of all, I want to say thank you for um, not only taking the time to talk to us, but uh, obviously doing um, a lot of research and it shows that you have much passion behind what you do. Um, and you lifted up in the beginning. I, I really appreciate how you um, lifted up the, the the 12 mothers of, 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 of the movement. And you also lifted up um, um, some fa fathers and mothers of the environmental uh, justice movement as well. One of the things that I wanted to uh, address is um, Professor Robert Bullard. He wrote, uh, whether by conscious design or institutional neglect, communities of color in urban ghettos, in rural poverty pockets, or on economically uh, uh, impoverished Native American reservations face some of the worst environmental devastation in our nation. And you have just really given us um, a real view of what that looks like. Um, I don't think that most of our community really understands um, the importance of environmental justice and what it actually can do. Can you kind of explain to us uh, and give us a little bit more understanding of how, of the importance of us being involved in mm -hmm. environmental justice and why it's important. Yeah, so I think why it is so critical, one for us to understand like what's happening to us. So that's, that's, that's step one um, is to make that more apparent. Um, so I, um, I'm a storyteller, so I want to uplift a specific example. Um, I want to uplift the, the work of Memphis Community Against Pollution. So with now Representative Justin J. Pearson and the work that they did around the Bahelia Pipeline. 
oftentimes with these polluters um, that, that come into our community, they come like a thief in the night. They come real quiet. They slither in there and they essentially come into black communities because they immediately think that one, we don't care. It is never, the, it is never ever the case that black folks don't care. We just don't know and we don't know by design, right? And so what was so compelling about that particular instance with the Bahelia Pipeline, that movement was started by people from the community that were being impacted. It took one person or one family to be like, hey, y'all, look at what these people are trying to bring into our community, right? So it started with the education piece. And with the education piece, we as Black people, we started community organizing, right? So we already knew what to do, especially being from a place like Memphis. It's in our DNA, right, to, to, to organize. And so I, I think as it relates to us showing up, it shows up with one, the education component. We can't gatekeep, we can't gatekeep information. We have to make sure that the masses know. Just as much as we share the tea on social media, we need to share the same information about things that are impacting the environment. And then the other part is fight back against people that are trying to bring toxicity and poison into our communities. And then the other part is us banding together and using our influence to hold people accountable. Um, so even with the map that I showed from Memphis Light, Gas and Water, that map wasn't designed until 2016 when you had community members. I want to uplift this brother, um, Chet Kibble from the Memphis and Shelby County Lead Safe Collaborative that have been screaming for decades, like it's lead in the water right? Have been educating people, getting people rallied around, but then held Memphis like us and water accountable to say, tell us where all these lead service lines are, but then also do your due diligence to replace them. And you can't just do all your replacements in Cooper Young and majority white communities. You need to go to where you already know the concentrated amounts of these lead service lines, for example, which would be in majority black communities. So I, I think that when we say to show up, we have to be active when we show up. So it, it, it's not just, you know, to be there only as an observer. We have to agitate. <laughs> we have to, to engage and spread this information to the masses. And then we have to be unapologetic in our next steps with holding these folks accountable. And that means that when we think about our roles, whether it be in a boardroom, okay, boards and commissions, whether it be an elected seat, whether it be as a parent, whether it be as a teacher, we all have to show up in this space and one accord because this stuff is killing us every day. We talk about gun violence, absolutely. But also environmental racism is killing us slowly as well. And I think um, one of the things is the reason why it's killing us slowly, and we hear this a lot in healthcare, is because it's a silent killer. Who, who, who knows what's actually happening around us. When I think about um, some of the uh, HOA meetings that we have or uh, community meetings around zoning or community meetings around, you know, elected officials, how many of us, um, our Black community show up or don't show up where this type of information is um, uh, offered, um, those that don't show up, like you stated before, it's not that we won't do something or say something or agitate, but it's also because we don't know. Can you speak to our own responsibility to put ourselves in environments where we can know or be exposed to this type of information? And the reason why I ask that is because on the, when you showed that map, what was it? Water and... Memphis like us and water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you showed it, it really spoke volumes, right? Because on some of the things I saw, um, like most of it was grayed out, but like in certain areas, it's like, it's a gray spot here, but it's a green spot right here. My mm -hmm. question would be, is why there's a green spot right there and then there's a gray spot right next door to it. What is that about? So can you can you expound on that a little bit more? <laughs> yeah, the, and that's, a, that's an excellent point. So I, I think, and the, this is one of the things that we try to do as an organization, we go to where people are as opposed to trying to make people come to us, right? 
Okay. Um, life be life. Okay. Um, we we talk about the the black community. There's so many things. There's so many obstacles on a daily basis that we're fighting. There's so many fires that that we have to put out, and so it 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 is. It behooves me. Um, with acknowledging like my flexibility where it's my responsibility to go where people are. Um, so for example, I think about some of the strategies that we use. One of my favorite uh, programs that we do is called Shop Talks, where we literally partner with local black barbershops, also beauty salons, where we go into the beauty shop and the barbershop and we talk about how we having a conversation right now. We bring up these issues surrounding environmental injustice um, and ways that like people can help themselves. So, for example, with the map that we looked at um, in the presentation, we take that to the barbershop. We literally sit down with people like type your address in and see if it's a lead service line. So, of course, it's mind blowing because it's like, dang, I didn't know that. Right. But then it's followed up with. Go ahead and we could send an email for you or we could call them right now so you could re request a test kit to see if it's actually lead leaching in your water. So it, it kind of goes back to what we saw during the civil rights movement. You can't just do like online campaigns where you click a button and it emails people. That's cute. And I'm not saying that that's not a good strategy. We have to do that too. It's both and. But I think like what is really critical is one, we go to where people are and the information that we are conveying, it has to be tangible. Like when you talk about environmental stuff, it can get real heavy and real technical. So you, we have to make sure that it's in a way that is translated, right? Like when we talk about literacy, it's not, it also includes like people being able to engage with information where they can genuinely internalize it and understand it. And a lot of times the way that environmental information is presented is hard. That's what, even in the presentation where I'm like, some of these chemicals have names that I can't even pronounce, but we still need to know what they are, right. but how and are we going to send it to the community? You know, yeah. yes. And its effects. I think uh, some of the topics, the things that you talked about, which was agrochemical innovation, um, uh, chemical uh, having a lasting impact from generation to generation to generation. And a lot of times, I think you made this point, is that family sometimes, at least um, within the last, it may have changed within the last 10 to 20 years, but there was a time that Black folks, pretty much their whole family stayed around the same area. And so mm -hmm. you would see, you know, uh, my grandmother who have, had had, dealt with fibroids then her daughter had felt with uh dealt with fibroids and then now the granddaughter who has now grown is is dealing with and you're like oh it just runs in the family and we just brush it off because that's how things are communicated in our community everything runs in the family right and mm -hmm. so we're not understanding the bigger picture that this is almost like a setup really yeah it's genocide <laughs> absolutely Absolutely. And I think you summed it up really well you, when you started off saying, um, talking about um, women having a choice, right? Mm -hmm. um, the quote that you uh, uh, spend to us, the womb is everybody's um, or everyone's first environment. And how important um, have we, do we understand the environment of the womb for a healthy baby, mentally, emotionally, you know, um, um, body wise as well. Can you speak on or close on um, what it means and how important it is for the decision makers who are often mm. men? Mm don't have wounds and do not know the 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 stresses does not know the ills of women yet alone black women mm -hmm. so what i'm asking you to do is speak to those persons yeah. and to share how important it is for women to have um free will and autonomy in regards to their own bodies 
Yeah, so speaking to 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 those individuals, and I'm so glad that you led with um y'all like that wounds, like the people that are making these decisions, <laughs> like I mean, how it's like the unmitigated gall. Like you literally have to listen to childbirthing people, people that actually can give birth. I mean, like, I don't care how many books you read. I don't care, like, how many briefs. I don't care. At the end of the day, a person with a womb is going to be your best expert. That That's first and foremost. The, the other part that I think is really important for those individuals that do have so much influence over my own womb um, <laughs> is, one, thinking about what it, so what is the, what is the bottom line? Right. So the bottom line, when we talk about like free will, when we talk about choice, it's a myriad of things that goes into those decisions. Right. So when I say like free will, free will to give birth. So not just from a lens. And I want to make sure that I clearly delineate this. I'm not just talking about abortion, because when we talk about this and we talk about reproductive justice. And again, this is not to disparage why women, but oftentimes we talk about reproductive justice through a white lens. It's always through abortion. When I talk about choice, I'm talking about me having a choice to have a healthy womb that if I do want to conceive that I'm not going to die when I try to give birth. It means that before I even reach puberty as a young girl, that my reproductive organs are not already in jeopardy because my mama experienced being exposed to environmental toxins and poison because my grandmother, my great grandmother. So we talk about choice, it's the full spectrum of decision-making around birth. It, it gives me like, the decision if I want to have a healthy birthing experience, not just me having a choice to conceive to have a baby, but I want this to be a healthy and a good experience, right? It Anything that is grounded in fear, something ain't right, right? And so I even think about, you know, with, with myself, I have not had children, but I'm gonna be honest, me and my whole generation, millennials and Gen, Gen Z who are now adults now, we hear often like they're not having babies, you know, from a place of resentment, but are you unpacking all of the reasons why, right? And even taking into consideration that like, there are so many variables that literally take away my choices, take away child be birthing people's choices before they can even sit down and think about it themselves. And so I, I think like the biggest thing or the biggest statement that I would make to those individuals who don't have wombs, but for some reason still have so much presidents in power uh, over, over wombs is listen to black women. Literally, when have we strayed? When, when have you gone astray? Right. Listen, listen to black women, uh, because that in turn, not just positively impacts just black women, but literally all women and all childbirthing people. And then also thinking about like how this is multifaceted. Like when we talk about, like I mentioned earlier, all of these things are interconnected. So when we talk about like with climate change and like how infrastructure is impa impacted by this extreme weather, that's the onus is not just on like a Memphis like gas and water, it's onus on like the healthcare industry, it's onus on your local government. Everybody is responsible for the protection of this, of this black womb, of wombs in general. And I think like that's the missing point is everyone, <laughs> having a responsibility for the protection of, of births, but listening to the appropriate source to best inform how we should be governing ourselves to get to a place where there is true free will as it relates to Black births and a Black birthing experience. Um, thank you so much for expounding on that. I, I As you were talking, it reminded me of um, some comments that um, Sister Reach's founder and CEO states in regards to uh, mothering. And she basically is expanding our understanding and definition of, of uh, mothering. And basically she says that um, 
the mothering behavior for the most part doesn't just really happen or the mothering instinct doesn't just really happen when at the time of birth, right? Uh, you begin to sometimes mother in your decision before the child even gets here, whether you want to bring it into a, a safe situation or, or even if you make a decision that, you know what, economically, I can't afford it. I don't want this child to come into this world. You are already doing motherly things by making, by making those decisions. And so uh, me being a man who have been raised around a lot of women and um, have really good uh, close women friends, I am not the subject matter expert of a woman's body, right? I can read, I can expose myself to education, but we need to be listening to the woman <laughs> or those birthing persons, right? Those people that have the ability to um, perform birth, right? Um, as we close, because I want to link as you, um, you did link um, uh, reproductive justice, environmental justice, and faith together. I want you to, uh, if you could, just talk about how they link and how faith is involved in all of this as we close out. You're on mute. You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no uh, so when um, closing it up, when you listening to you, it made me think about one of my favorite phrases that um, I see a lot of people use where being your ancestors wildest dream. And so when I, I think about the, the connection between reproductive justice, environmental justice, and faith, I want Black people to be able to have full latitude to dream and to dream vividly. And when I think about births, I want, I want people to feel like they're able to, to contribute to that, right? To be like unadulterated, like having full autonomy to usher in like the next generation of black people. And it keeps going and going and going. And, and it's in, it's not, it's, there's no inhibitions, right? So when I, I think about like the historical trajectory that I laid out in the presentation, and when I keep, I kept talking about like, where was black women's access to free will? So we all are responsible for that, right? So when we think about like bringing in life, it's not even just like the onus, like just on that mother, on that child birthing people. It's a requirement of advocates. So you mentioned the like, I don't have a womb, but that's okay. We still need you as an advocate. You are still a part of this village and this tribe. Um, when we, another big thing that I, I think like connecting it back to like the faith aspect, we have to decode, we have to approach this from a very anti-colonial perspective. The way in which we think about birth and it might be consciously or unconsciously is so much through the lens of Western society or whiteness. And I think that it is imperative as people from African descent that we go back to how do we define this process, right? It looks different than what Europeans experience. How do we get back to who we are at our core and who we want to continue to be? Um, I think is, is is paramount when we think about this interconnection between RJ, EJ, and spirituality. And then the other part of this is when we talk about <laughs> we talk about teaching, we need to see more interaction and collaboration with faith-based institutions, particularly black ones, that talk about reproductive health. When we talk about these different concepts around life where we think life comes from, right? <laughs> so we talk about like education, it has to be in all the spaces in which we convene as black people. It needs to be second nature, whether you're a childbirth in person or not, we all have to see ourselves as being 
and unity on one accord around how we continue to make Black people. When we talk about the biggest one up to white supremacy, it's Black births. If you want to be the most monumental and defeating white supremacy it is healthy and successful black births and so we think about black liberation you can't talk about black liberation if you're not talking about black reproductive justice if we're not talking about environmental justice so i think that's what i will leave with is we all have a responsibility um as, as people but even you know in the black community around making a better experience for childbirthing people to maintain this black excellence that we know will sustain us. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Latricia. You have given us so much to chew on. Thank you so much for your due diligence uh, with us and hanging out with Sister Reach today and uh, presenting all the wonderful information that you have provided to us. Um, thank you again for your time and your voice. And we continue to send you blessings as you continue to do this type of work. Thank you so much for joining us and you have a great evening. Thank you.